of the week. So <laughs> my plan for today is also to give some kind of introduction to the modular space of cars and the aspects it has that are in of interest to us and to explain to you what is the uh, what is main aim for this course mainly. Cheers. So what are we going to work with? This is the way I write MGN. So you will not be surprised to know that this is the moduli space uh, of smooth genus G curves with N distinct mark points. So for me it makes sense to consider this moduli space only under this assumption on the relationship between the number of marked points and the genus of the curves considered. So what is this guy? This is the moduli space of n plus 1 tuples c p1 up to pn, where c is a non-singular projective curve of genus G and P1 up to Pn are distinct mark points. So we will consider it not so much as a moduli space, like a collection of isomorphism classes, but rather as a stack. So we will consider the fact that it parameterizes families of a, a given base, in particular that it has a, a universal family. For the kind of invariance I'm interested in, the fact that this is a stack rather than the scheme is not particularly important. It has something to do with the fact that if you fix a curve and the number of mark points on it, there may be automorphisms. And this is the kind of the addition of additional structures which is encoded if you look at the stack rather than the associated coarse moduli space, which is just parameterizing the isomorphism classes. The only nice thing of working in this setup is that it ensures that there is an existence of a universal curve. And this gives some kind of canonical way to reconstruct to the point of the moduli space, the curve with its marked points, and even to fit it into a family. So if we fix a base, a base scheme S, can you read here? Then the closed points of MGN over S are flat families of genus G curves, and to be able to give n mark points over each element of the family, we need to have n disjoint sections.
Gio, and I have, of course, to be at least dinner. So if there are no mark points, there is no need to find the sections. But this is the way to look at the points of our space. And as I said, if one prefers to look at the scheme, one can look at the associated coarse moduli space. And morally, I mean, it does not fit well in this more formal definition of what the stack was, but morally, is just the space of isomorphism classes of n pointed genus G curves. I guess I forgot to write smooth here. And of course, then one should do it over S, and then it would be curves over S. Well, this is just a scheme of the same dimension. And as I said, if you don't worry about how many math points you have, you don't have to worry too much about this uh, um, scheme versus stack business, because if you have sufficiently ma many math points, uh, then there are no automorphisms on your curve. So these two objects are going to become eventually the same. Moreover, this is not a particularly scary space to look with, to work with, because it will, can be actually realized quite uh, nicely as a quotient, exactly in the way it uh, was originally constructing using geometric invariant theory, and then realizing it as a global space, uh, parametrizing pluricanonically embedded curves, and then dividing by the appropriated automorphous group of the projective space in which the curves are embedded. So, what I was trying to convince you, yes. So, something I forgot to write is, well, this guy, MGN, one of the advantages of looking at it as a stack, is that it's a smooth stack, because of the fact that all information occurs with automorphism is coming together here, this scheme may well have singularities. But anyway, because of the fact that it comes from this nice, smooth stack, this guy just has locally quotient singularities. So the stack. And the course modular space. So this is all a very good theory, but we have already discussed today that of course smooth curves can degenerate to singular curves. There is just no way to prevent it, because if you have a curve, there, is a, there are families that can't be filled by uh, adding a smooth curve in the missing point. So if one wants to be able to complete families, one needs to allow singular curves. The other problem is, of course, that we have distinct mark points. So even if the curve does not degenerate, we have to find some kind of replacement for the phenomenon in which two, two points are coming together. So if two points are coming together, let's say that P1 and we have P1 and P2 in the family approaches P1. So we have a family parametrized by C itself. We need to be able to decide what happens in the case in which P1 and P2 coincide. 
and we don't want exactly to say, well, but uh, we could, as a first approximation, say, well, we don't care that the points are distinct, because if we want to have a good moduli space, we always want the automorphism group of the objects we are considering to be finite. And this was exactly the condition that was ensuring finiteness. But then if the points are coming together, then the, the, the fact that we have n points, well, we have actually have less. So this part of the definition is not going to be satisfying anymore. So we're lucky, for course, that is a natural way to find a nice class of uh, singular curves that can be added to compactify our moduli space, so our moduli problem. This leads to the, the linear Manford compactification. So, I guess it has not, uh, it has not been uh, in existence for 50 years yet, but uh, close to. So perhaps we should uh, uh, track down the first paper and organize a birthday party at some point. And this is the modular space of stable and pointed of genus G. So what are now the elements of M bar G and S? They are again. Family, a flat family of curves with n sections. Well, we have to look at flat families because, of course, we want things to be invariant under deformation. So this is our guarantee. There are no strange jumps uh, in the kind of objects we are taking. But this also gives, is giving us an indication that with kind of genus we need to consider, because if you remember, one can define the genus in several ways. There is a geometric genus, which is the genus of the normalization. This is what you find by looking at global and differential forms, generalizing the uh, definition for smooth curves in that way. But anyway, what we need to look at, if we want to have a flat family, it should be a flat family of curves of arithmetic genus G. And because of the fact that we want degenerate objects to be as easy as possible, we are lucky in this case. We can just, it's enough to assume that we are working with nodal curves. So we simply need to uh, allow the easiest type of, of singularities. we have to consider is the arithmetic genus, which in itself already ensures that the family is flat. And the curves we consider may be reducible, but they have to be so possible. What I want to say is they, they may possibly be reduced, but they anyway have to be connected. Then there is a condition on the section. They still have to be disjoint sections. But what we want them is that they, they can't uh, hit 
the singular low side of the curves. So they have two style inside the singular locus, and then we want to have a stability condition. that ensures that the automorphous group of the curve is finite. So when is the automorphism of the group finite? The idea is that this kind of condition, which is actually the Euler characteristic, of a complex, smooth, oh, sorry, what I want to say, this is actually the Euler characteristic of a smooth curve of genus G with n points removed and then multiplied by minus one, but perhaps. The point is, we need to have, the, this is exactly the condition that ensures the finiteness of the automorphism group. So for each irreducible component, <coughs> we have that the genus for the component, multiplied by two, minus two plus the number of special points so we take the pre-images of the mark points and the singular points in the normalization of the component this should be positive <laughs> sorry this was stupid or the equivalent one could take the Euler characteristic of the component, remove from it the set of mark points, not all of them may lie on it, and also all singular points, and this should be negative because uh, if you, to understand why I'm writing this, oh, this is not minus, this is. The reason why I'm writing this, so this is just the same formula you have here multiplied by minus one. The reason I'm writing this is that it has uh, some uh, more intuitive interpretation if we think of a field of complex numbers, then our curves, then all components, or at least their normalizations, give Riemann surfaces, and the idea is that the automorphous group of a Riemann surface with some mark points is finite if and only if, if we remove from the surface all marked points, we get a hyperbolic curve, so a curve of a, a negative genus. The idea is that is a compact Riemann surface has a non-trivial automorphism group when there is some group acting on it, and this is sort of flattens the metric on it, and this gives a, and this is, cannot happen if the 
Euler characteristic of the curve is negative. But if we look at this formula, just uh, 2g minus 2 plus n is bigger than 0, we see that actually this can become negative. Well, the only thing that can be negative is minus 2. So this is only significant if we have g equal to 1, in which case we need n to be at least 1, or if we have g equal to 0, in which case we need n at least 3. So actually, the only additional condition, if we assume this to start with, is that every time you have a rational component, there are at least three special, special points on it. So each rational component, so each component of genus 0, And the points should be counted on the normalization. So if we have something like a self-intersection, then it counts as two special points. And again, this compactifying space has all good properties the previous one had. So it's, again, a smoothly reducible, the linear Manfold stack. But now, it's complete. And if we look back at the history of the subject, this is the space nature that arises from the construction from geometric invariant theory, and this ensures that we can actually define this directly over Z. So we can make sense of this over any possible field or ring we may wish to consider. And if we just wish, uh, if you don't, for some reason, don't wish to maintain all information about uh, automorphism groups of the elements, so if we are just happy to work with the uh, isomorphism classes of, cu of stable curves parameterized in this way, then we can work directly with the coarse modular space, which is, of course, a scheme. with these spaces. Well, the idea is that most of the time we work over the field C of complex numbers, so we are actually working with modular spaces of Riemann surfaces, or these kind of degenerations that are created by patching together pieces of Riemann surfaces uh, by identifying points and creating the nodal singularities. And we will look at uh, at the cohomology of the space. So the, this is the most flexible but significant invariant that's attached to this.
So why is this interesting? Well, for some cases, it, the constructions will be very close for what one can do with Chow groups. In other cases, we will try to uh, discuss classes that have nothing to do with the space, with cycles on the modular space. What is the motivation mainly? Well, the first motivation is, a, I guess, um, how the one of the main motivations to study the modular space of curves, to understand uh, its enumerative geometry, to, so to be able to count uh, how many degenerations uh, and of which time. Uh, there in each family. And this, of course, is some kind of enumerative information which can be found by taking the intersection product in the, um, in the Chow ring. But it's, in many cases, the relevant information survives through cohomology. So this is certainly sufficiently interesting. And then there are two kind of motivations that are sort of um, autonomous. So because of the fact uh, of the way in which the geometry of curves work, Cohomology groups in themselves may have uh, interesting interpretations coming from number theory as spaces of modular forms. So in some, space, in some cases, studying cohomology group of these modular spaces is going to give us some kind of a geometric interpretation of spaces of modular forms that are coming from number theory. And you know, it does not matter whether the input is coming from number theory and we can give some kind of a geometric interpretation for it, or if the thing is going the other direction, we can use geometry to prove something that people in number theory can see for themselves. But the point is there is some kind of interaction which can be very useful for both sides. And then I must say, I would say most of the application of results about modular spaces of curves uh, so far in the last uh, decades has been to mathematical physics because they are uh, related to the construction of cohomological field theories, like when looking at gromov wittgenstein invariants. So, as I hinted at before, both the modular space of smooth curve and the modular space of stable curves are actually quotients. So the idea is that we don't want to make this so very explicitly, but the idea is that anyway, globally, M by GN has been constructed by saying, well, there is some projective variety that parameterizes all possible embedding, embeddings of the, the stable curve in a sufficiently large projective space. Now I'm not trying to add the marked points in this, uh, in this story, but then of course uh, one can add them as well by taking some kind of incidence correspondence, so it's not... Uh, and then quotienting it by the action of the automorphisms group of the space in which the things were embedding. So the idea is that this is globally a quotient. And this means that when we are looking at its cohomology, we can reinterpret it as a covariant cohomology of this space. 
And this is the way to define it. Actually, it would even work if we wanted to work with cohomology with integral coefficients, but it, will be, it would be much harder. And this kind of construction would work even with, with the integral coefficients. The problem is that uh, everything becomes much more delicate. And in that case, the results just in very small genus, I think, nothing further than genus two. since we are working over C, there is even a way to realize MGN bar globally as a quotient of a smooth projective variety by a finite group. So this group business can be done very, um, one can even reduce to the case in which one is working with a finite group. So the idea is that to do this, one needs to put some extra structure, which is called in this case a level structure. We will perhaps touch on the basic case of this, which only works for smooth curves. But anyway, the fact that this is possible is non-trivial. I think it's due to Loyenhaun, the compactification for n equal to zero, and then to his students, Picard and Boggi. beginning of this century. So why is this nice? Well, if we have that our MGN, but it actually works with any stack. Yeah, sure. Ah, uh, yeah. The idea is that uh, I, I didn't want to write it uh, <laughs> in too much detail, but the idea is that if you want uh, simply to parameterize curves, you want to find some kind of intrinsic way to embed them into a projective space. So natural choice is to look at the canonical embedding. And then you look again and you say, yeah, but this is not going to work for hyperelliptic curves because those are the exception. So one needs to look at least at uh, B canonical embeddings, but actually one say, yeah, well, actually if one wants to be able to embed all smooth curves without any trouble, one needs three canonical embeddings. Okay, that's good. But then one wants to apply geometric invariant theory and make sure that the kind of the degenerations that one takes is independent of how high the embedding is. Because one says, well, this is actually a procedure that stabilizes. So we need to take a pluricanonical embedding, but we want to be able to be free to take a higher uh, power without changing the a kind of stable curves we are admitting because, of course, there are clear uh, theoretical advantages in doing this. Also, the other point is that uh, if you take a canonical embedding, which is to, well, otherwise it would not get our stable curves, but we will get something slightly, um, uh, slightly different than with uh, 
with curves which are not stable, but just three stable. So uh, I think that one needs to take a five canonical embedding at least to make it work. So it's not, it will not be nice to uh, write the equations for all possible uh, five canonical embeddings of stable curves, but it's a problem that one can approach, uh, you know, theoretically and look at which kind of stability conditions there are there uh, for the action of the uh, of the uh, of PGLN, and this is the kind of embeddings we are taking. And of course, if one wants to take uh, uh, marked points into the story, one needs to to add them into the projective variety, so one needs uh, uh, to take again an n plus one tuple in which the first part is the, the embedding on the curve, and then one needs to take all the, all the curves. And I must say, if you are interested in the um, GIT construction with mark points, uh, actually this is very, this is not uh, explicitly done in any of the historical references, so one can find uh, uh, much more recent work, perhaps yeah, now 10, uh, 10 to 15 years old. Um, I can give you a reference about this, but for instance, Baldwin. So, what I was trying to say is, if we are lucky, and what we get is simply the quotient of a variety by a group, This is, as I said already, a story of LC. Then, if we want to look at the cohomology of the quotient with rational coefficients, this is actually just the same thing as looking at the cohomology of the variety. And then take the G invariant. So if one is working with a finite group, one does not even need to look for the, for the equivalent cohomology. It's just the invariant part of just a very classical cohomology. That's the reason why the situation is much la uh, nicer there. But uh, this only works if one is taking rational coefficients because the map going from, going from here to there um, has something to do with the fact that you have to take an average. Yeah. I'm afraid it's only over C. I should have to look it up. But uh, I mean, it's made using level structures, so I do think that they are truly taking structures on the on the cohomology, like it's done uh, for classical level structures. So if you want to frame cohomology, then yeah. So this is one of the reasons why it's nice to work over Q. The other reason. that from the point of view of geometry, it's very nice to be able to work with the stack because we can make many more constructions here because of the fact that, as I said, that the main feature is that we have a universal curve over this. So it's not just that we can, that we have some kind of isolated isomorphism classes below. It's just over each point we have a some kind of natural way to recover the curve. But for many constructions, it's also very difficult to keep track exactly that uh, the kind of construction we are using is respecting the stack structure. So it's very practical that if we work with rational coefficients, we don't need to make a distinction which, between uh, the cohomology of the stack and the one of the coarse moduli space. Uh, why is that? Well, the point is that the information which we are forgetting has something to do with the automorphous groups, which are finite, they are torsion, so they can't produce anything interesting uh, at the level uh, of, uh, of cohomology as soon as we take Q coefficients. Yeah. Uh, in the case you have a 
stuck with which is a global portion. Is yes. this the definition of the rational cohomology, or you define it? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I know I'm being vague here. So actually what I wanted to say here, I'm just taking the scheme theoretic quotient of a, of a, of a scheme by a, by a group and I'm not uh, uh, worrying about the stacking structure. But the point is that, uh, so in any case, it's not the definition. If you want to take a definition, you need to work with equivalent cohomology. Or if you want to have chowdings, with equivalent chowdings. That's the good way to define the cohomology. Otherwise, you could uh, go back. Uh, yeah, I mean, th there are some alternatives, but mainly the best choice is to work directly with equivalent cohomology with these kinds of spaces. What I wrote here is was already thinking. I was already thinking with a variety in mind because this would not be the standard notation for the quotient stack. Quotient stacks are written with square brackets. But I don't want to make a point of this because, as I said, if we are not uh, we are not behaving so nicely with respect to the stack structure, actually, for what we are doing, it will not matter. So. Um, I try to think about the stack as often as possible because the geometry here is much better. But if we replace by mistake our uh, stack with a, a different one, with the same uh, coarse modular space, we are not in trouble. We can do it all the, side, all the time. And if one is topologically oriented, our way of constructing MGN is not particularly natural. Actually, there is some kind of topological or analytic construction of MGN. So how does one construct MGN when one is not an algebraic geometry? Depending exactly on the way you construct uh, your modular space is going to give you a, some kind of topological stack or just a, a manifold, uh, an odd before perhaps. So if you're topological oriented and you want to parameterize all possible uh, compact Riemann surfaces of genus G, well, then you look at them and you say, well, but actually, topologically, they are all the same because there is just one isomorphism class of orientable surfaces of genus G, well, compact orientable surfaces. So the idea is that we can fix a surface of genus G, and then MG parameterizes all possible choices of a complex structure on it. For instance, we can denote it by SG. So what one obtains in this case, it's a very large space, the so-called Teich-Müller space, the space of complex structures. can be realized 
itself as a topological, as a smooth manifold. And the important thing is that this is contractible. So to take a choice of a complex structure on a smooth surface may be a complicated business, but anyway, we can, there is a contraction of this guy to a point. So from a topological point of view, it's not a complicated thing. The problem is that, of course, some complex structures can give isomorphic Riemann surfaces. So we have to divide it by some group. This is what is called the mapping class group. So the idea is that we have to divide by diffeomorphisms, which are orientation preserving. So this is just part of the definition. The point is, of course, this would act on Tg, and the quotient will give the isomorphism classes we want to have, but two diffeomorphisms may define the same structure. They do this exactly when they lie in the same connected component of the group I've just written. So one does not really need to take this, one needs to take the group of connected component of the group of diffeomorphisms on a fixed Riemann's A on a fixed oriented surface. So, so this means that one needs to divide by the component of this group that contains the identity. The idea is that you can deform a different model to the identity, then it's actually also trivial, acting trivial on that value on the complex structures. So if one takes the stack quotient here, one gets again our mg in a different incarnation. I would like so to stress that this is now a discrete group because it's a group of connect it's a group of connected components. So of a larger group, and, it's, and this gamma G is called the mapping class group. So this is true, but let's say as topological stacks, or if you want to take the quotient and then you take the, the cross modular space. Just work, look at the uh, isomorphism classes, so at the quotient, then you get the coarse moduli space, and gamma G, as I said, is called the mapping class group. Ingenious G. So, the reason why this is done is that if you have, have fixed the your orientable surface, then you are free to make many, to put a lot of structure on it and to find very explicit parametrizations. So actually, depending on the problem which one is interested, uh, this may be a very, a very explicit description. It can be useful, but it has nothing to do, of course, with algebraic geometry. And of course, one can produce a variation of this idea that works with marked points. So it's simply one needs to add more data here and to be preserved there. And even with, uh, with boundaries, which is something that does not make sense either in algebraic geometry, but makes sense in a topological setting.
so I will just show a picture. So we all know what a marked point is. It's just a fixed point, so that's not the problem. But something which one can do if one is working just on surfaces is to make a hole in them. So instead of marking a point, to cut a small circle into it. And then one can use this kind of circle to attach together other Riemann surfaces or other compact surfaces with the boundary removed. So this means that we can take another one. It works more nicely if we parameterize the boundary. So the orientation is giving us in which direction we can move around the removed boundary, and then we give an explicit parameterization of it. It will always be a small circle. So we can take another one and then sort of attach them together. So in this kind of world, there are natural ways to transform a surface with boundary of a certain genus to a surface with boundary of a boundary with a higher genus. If we want, uh, if you start with a curve, let's say a, a rational curve, and we mark a point, we can't uh, simply say, well, now we have a standard way to transform this uh, into a curve of genus one with a marked point. But in this kind of world, one can say, well, if we fix the thing we, we, we attach to it, perhaps we need to, and we have boundary here, we can always attach it. So it's a, it's a different way to look at it, but it also shows why this kind of approach is good for studying the dependency on the cohomology, on the genus. So this is, I would say, the, the kind of problem in which the topologists uh, have been uh, most successful recently. In comparison with the algebraic geometers, at least. <sighs> yeah, you can. I, I can look up a reference about this for you, if you wish. But to me, it looks very unnatural. So to me, it looks like they want to have MG and bar, so they are sort of artificially gluing things on the boundary to produce exactly MG and bar. Still, the, the procedure of the generations is working well, because uh, uh, somehow degenerating a curve from a topological point of view how do you create a node? Yeah. On a Riemann surface, the idea is that you fix some kind of loop. If you are truly into the business, of course, you will fix the geodesics and not just anything, because of course they are uh, hyperbolic surfaces with a flat metric, uh, with a hyperbolic metric that kind of things. And the idea is that you can fix a parameterization and make this. Uh, Narrower and narrower, and so in this way you get the, the stable Riemann surface you expect as a limit. So somehow if you want to produce MGN bar out of this construction for MGN, what you need to do is to parameterize the, to add to the data the length of the inappropriated geodesics and make it go to zero, and this explains to you how to put together the, the elements in the boundary. But anyway, when I submitted uh, my proposal for these lectures, I thought that the, I mean, my I decided on the aim, and my aim was try to try to illustrate to you as many ways as possible to construct cohomology classes on these modular spaces to illustrate uh, how rich the cohomology theory is, but also which kind of meaning these classes may have for the geometry of the moduli space. So 
So, of course, if you want to answer this question and you have a fixed candidate, you may be in good shape as long as you have some nice explicit description of all, of all curves that occur there. And you can try to parameterize the space of equation and so on, like in the case of M2, where there was just uh, this polynomial of degree 6, and somehow all information on the isomorphism class of the curve was like there. But if one wants to be able to construct cohomology classes in general, one needs to have something that works independently of the genus. Anyway, the first one to work on this problem in the 80s, and again, I can also recommend his 1982, well, actually published 1983 paper, about the cohomology of M2 bar. The idea is that if one wants to have a universal construction, one looks at the prototypical example of a modular space, which is, says Manford, the Grassmannian of vector subspaces in a fixed vector space. Considering it as a grammar of subspaces, it does not really matter for what we are doing. And then let's see, let's say it's k dimensional subspaces in, in Cn. So, this can be considered as the modular space of such subspaces, and it has again a universal family. And since it's parameterizing vector subbundles, the universal family is just a universal subbundle. Let's call it S for subbundles. So the idea is that S lies inside the uh, trivial uh, vector bundle of rank n over g. And it has, of course, a quotient. So s has rank k, and the quotient has rank n minus k. So then from this construction, well, first, of course, we, we are not worrying too much about what the cohomology of the Chow groups of G are, because G has a nice cellular decomposition, as you know, of affine spaces. You can stratify it by affine spaces. So in this case, the Chow ring is the same thing as the cohomology ring. It's just uh, generated linearly by the classes of the cells. And uh, this leads to the theory of Schubert cycles, uh, and so on. But in this case, what I wanted to say, well, the generators are just all chain classes of the subbundle. So the thing to look at is the chain classes of the universal bundle in this case. Of course, we have no universal bundle in our case. And then if one wonders about how to get relations where one can use the sequence to say, well, because we know that the rank of Q is n minus k, then its chain class is up to in degree larger than the dimension have to vanish. And actually this is enough also to give all relations. So So if we look here, then we have to take what we had for S and invert because of the sequence. So 
because we take the sun, then we invert, and then I was saying, well, if you look at the part of this which has degree L, which is at least n minus k plus 1, then this has to vanish. And this can be reinterpreted as even relations here, and this is a, a completely explicit uh, description of the cohomology of our Grassmannian. So this is what we would like to copy. The part, uh, the, um, part about creating classes, defin defining them, can be copied very easily. The business with relations is actually much harder. And of course, there is no guarantee that what we get with this kind of constructions will give us this, the whole cohomology, because uh, mg and bar is a space with an interesting geometry, so we can't stratify it by putting together affine spaces. So for sure, there is no reason why cohomology and Chow agree, and no reason why it's generated by uh, linearly by classes that are easy to identify. But anyway, this was the idea. So we look at the universal family. Of M by the N. So we are now introducing apparently a new thing, but actually, The universal family of uh, M by GN is the same thing as taking M bar N plus 1. Because the idea is that, well, if we start with n mark points, well, if we take a new point, so the additional, po in the universal family, we simply need to take an additional point and let it move on the curve. So as long as it's distinct from the mark points or the singular points of the curve, we are not in trouble. If they hit, so let's say that P hits uh, the point N, this is actually the image This can be. So we keep track of where the point N was, and here we take a genus zero component and we put on it, on it the P and N, and this is the kind of thing that happens. The way we reinterpret the case in which the point that we left move, we, uh, which we moved on the curve hit one of the. Uh, mark points. If the point hits uh, a singular point, then we can sort of blow up the node to give us two distinct branches. Then there will be an exceptional divisor of the blow up, which will be something of genus zero. And then we put P inside. And if you remember the discussion we already had in this lecture in the previous one, when we have three points on the rational curve, then they have no moduli. So as this is just uh, encoding the same information and saying P is the point, uh, uh, P has moved to the singular point. So, now, that if we are looking at the universal family, we can create some kind of universal, uh, some kind of vector bundles using the data, which is here.
so the idea is that I want you to think about this uh, as something which happens on the universal family, but we think it, we can uh, mg m bar g n plus one is just some modular space in which we have uh, at least one mark point. So this is something uh, simply a construction that makes sense at any point as long as we have some mark points. And we can say, well, some way of construct a vector bundle over MGN bar is to take, to look at where the mark point is, or the point on the universal curve, if you prefer, and look at its contangent space to the, uh, to the curve. smooth curve and we have some mark point pj on it, then we can consider the tangent line to this and also take its quantity, the cotangent space which is behaving more positively, so that's what we want to take. And then if we let the curve move in the modular space, then this is going to give us a line bundle. J to be one of the math points. And if you're thinking about over the uni universal family, we can take the last one, for instance. this is a line bundle on M bar G N. We can take its first chain plus and for sure this will give both an element of the cohomology in degree two and if you prefer, of course, this would also work in the, in the first child group. Then, of course, this does not make sense if n is equal to zero, but then, as I said, if n is equal to zero, we simply go and look at the universal family. This gives the so-called Kappa classes, the Miller, Morita, Manford classes. So what is the idea here? Well, we don't know what n is. It may be equal to zero, but then we look at the universal family. We always have a psi class there, the last one. And we can take any power of it and push it down to mg n bar using the universal family. And now we are looking at higher powers, so we will have algebraic classes of higher degree. We already discussed in the previous lectures that is a, a natural bundle over MGN, which actually extends also over MGN bar because it actually depends on the definition of the universal family, the Hodge band. So let's see. 
the idea, well, this again works the same whether we have uh, marked points or not. So, over such point C of the modular space, we can take the space of regular differentials. So this, of course, works well if we are working over a smooth curve, but it actually can be extended in general. So the idea is that one takes the uh, shift of relative differentials of the universal family. I'm not writing G N here because it does not really play a role. And this, of course, lives on the universal family, so one takes the one push it down again. And now we have a rank G vector bundle over mg bar, if you wish also over mg bar n, and one we can take, yes. Has this nice natural global definition. Can you define the line bundles globally? Like you just Sorry. Like the term in terms of their fibers. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is also, yeah, that is fiddling a little bit, yes, with the, with the universal family itself. So the idea is that if one truly understands how the thing is defined, then there is a natural way to figure out how, how to give the global definition. And personally, I'm specifically worried about this because, you see, the dimension of the space of differentials drops if there is no component of genus G. So uh, the, the chain classes of the Hodge bundle are going to uh, vanish on the low side on which there is no, uh, on which there is no component of genus G. So this is... Uh, this makes it much less intuitive to, to think about this bundle uh, over the locus of MGN of curves, uh, of MGN bar of curves, uh, with only components of smaller genus. in general, but of course, since this is a rank G bundle, one, one has to stop the G if one wants to have something on T. So somehow what uh, Muffel thought about these classes is, is, some, is something one should keep in mind when defining them. So the geometric intuition is that the lambda classes are natural because they have something to do with the shift of differentials, and this shift is geometrically related to the fact that curves have a Jacobian, which is an abelian variety, and so somehow the lambda classes come from the fact that they are the uh, natural cohomology classes on the modular space of abelian varieties. So they are there also for the modular space of curves because there is a, a very precise relation, but they are not particularly, not necessarily so natural for the geometry of MGN. On the other hand, these kappa classes are new, and uh, uh, at least the, what, this was what Manford expected, but it turned out to be right. They should have some kind of specific meaning for the geometry of the modular space of curves, and indeed, uh, kappa 1 is the ample one, one that is used to prove the projectivity of the modular space. So, so far we have a collection of classes. We will actually see that 
the lambda classes are not independent. One could actually forget them from the theory. So they are useful because they are geometrically natural, but they are an example of classes that can be expressed in terms of the other ones. But then, which other natural classes do we want to consider? Well, the point is we want to consider the boundary strata classes, the classes the, the components of the locus of curves that have, have at least a fixed number of nodes. it was but the idea is that one moves at curves that have at least a fixed number of points of singular points the number of singular points on the curve is at least k and actually each one so these are, of course, lost. so the reducible components of this guy are, of course, closed subvarieties of the modular space of curves. So one wants to be able to take, a natural thing to take is to take the fundamental classes. If we impose the condition that there are, there are at least k singular points, this is something about deformation theory, then the dimension of this locus, the co-dimension of this locus, the, the, of all components of this locus is k, so they will give a collection of fundamental classes, co-dimension k means in degree 2k. Of course, one can do the same in child. And these are what we call the boundary strata classes. Of course, we can deal better with them if we understand better what the combinatorics of the boundary is. And usually, we do this by using stable graphs. So the idea is that, well, each such reducible component corresponds to the topological type of a degeneration. Smooth curves are all the same, but if we are working with a nodal curve, then we need, then there is some kind of combinatorial information attached to it. We need, want to know, for instance, what the general of all components are, so how many components there are, what their genus is, which points have been identified, if one wants to take the, the map from the normalization to the stable curve. that every, every time we have a stable curve C, well, of course, if we have a R point, we can extract from it the combinatorial information about its topological type, and this is encoded in its, in its dual graph. So, let me 
title sketch an example. So let's say we have a curve, a component which is a curve of genus C. And then uh, there are two other components that have genus 2. And here we have a component of genus 0. Well, we said that this, is, this needs to be stable, so we need at least two mark points here, but perhaps we can have three. Oh, yes. From this picture, there are no... Um, so I will turn this into a component of geometric genus 3 with a node. So the genus I write is just the geometric genus of the component. So it's a, it's a genus of the normalization. So this is what gives the genus label in this picture. So let's say the points 1, 2, and 3, say on this genus 0 component, and then, for instance, on this one here we have the label for. This is stable because I put sufficiently many points here, so which is the information we want to keep in mind. So we want to attach to each component a vertex of the graph labeled with the genus. This will be actually a labeled graph with also some open uh, leaves. So here we have uh, one, two, three, four components, one of genus three, two of genus two, and one of genus zero. And components of genus zero are often just written as black dots because of the fact that it's very difficult to write a zero inside uh, without uh, having it looking very strange. Also good for print. So then each node should correspond to an edge of the graph. And since a node joins to irreducible components, it should be an edge that joins exactly the vertices which are associated to the components that meet, for instance. So this zero, genus zero thing just meets one of the g two genus two components. So let's say it's this one. Then the genus two component which is here meets the genus three, also the genus three and the genus two component. So it goes like that. And then let's check this is everything. So the other genus two component also meets the genus three one. And then we have one additional node, this self intersection of the genus three component, which is going us an edge starting and arriving at the same component. And then we need to Keep in mind where the mark points are. And the mark points correspond to mark leaves of the graph, which start exactly at the corresponding vertices. So here, one, two, and three start at the genus zero vertex. And then we have an additional one, which is on the genus two vertex not meeting. So that's far. And this is the dual graph of this curve, but it's actually a kind of construction that works in general. We start with the curve, we can reconstruct the graph, but if we have the graph, just by picking the components, we can construct the normalization of the, of the stable curve. We need to know how many leaves, uh, so how many edges or leaves are starting at each component, so in this way we get the normalization. And then the way in which constructed the edges tells us what we need to identify uh, to construct the stable curve. So I guess that this is everything for today. I hope it was not uh, too long. <laughs>